This is part two of lecture four. And this part will be talking about first impressions. How do we uh, make a judgment about a person when we first meet this person? And this has everything to do with the general theme of social perception. This is how we form impressions and make inferences about people. And researchers, especially social psychologists, are very interested in this topic. And there's been quite some research uh, on this, and I think also very nice research. I will now uh, tell you about one of my favorite studies done on uh, the topic of social perception. In this research, um, the, the, the social psychologist uh, Willis and Todorov wanted to know how quickly people form impressions of others. And what they did was they invited participants to the lab, and they placed them behind a computer screen, and they showed them pictures of people, random people they didn't know. And they showed these pictures very, very quickly. So either 100 milliseconds, which is one tenth of a second, so super, super quick, or half a second, or a thousand milliseconds, so that's one full second. So still really, really a short time. So they show the picture, and then they ask questions about the person in the picture. Um, so I will now do this little experiment with you. I will show you a picture in the screen very quickly. So please look at the screen carefully. And I will show the, uh, the picture really, really fast, okay? Pay attention and I will ask questions after that. So you saw a person on the picture, hopefully. Now my question to you is how reliable do you think this person is? And of course, you don't know this person, but what would be your sort of gut feeling? Do you think this person is reliable or unreliable? Okay. And secondly, I want to ask you, how certain are you of your answer? This was exactly what the participants also did in the study by Willis and Todorov. And the researchers were interested in how quickly for, uh, people form impressions and also how their uh, perspective of how certain they are of their answers, if that changes to the extent that they can watch a picture for a longer period of time. So let's now look at the results uh, of this study. So uh, here you see a graph and you see that actually um, how high the bar is for 100, 500 or 1000 milliseconds is basically the same. This means that um, people come up with a judgment about a person really, really quickly. And this doesn't depend on how long they can look at the picture. They replicated this experiment again with uh, when people could look at the picture as long as they wanted and still the judgment remained the same. So this means that within one, one tenth of a second, we already form an impression about the personality of a, pic uh, of a person. That's weird, huh? I mean, you don't know the person based on what a person looks like. We already have a gut feeling about a personality. So I ask you a question about reliability, but this study has also been done again by asking questions about how intelligent do you think this person is? How competent do you think this person is? Um, a trustworthy, attractive, you name it. Basically, all different uh, personality traits were measured, and for it didn't matter which personality trait was asked about, Participants came up with a judgment, and the judgment didn't change. The only thing that did change over time was how certain people were of their answer. So the longer people could look at the picture, the more convinced they were that they were actually correct, even though they didn't know the person at all. Um, so um, there's consequences uh, of this, because, of course, we already saw in lecture three, we extensively talked about how once we have an opinion about a person, this also sets in motion our behavior. And this is something we'll be talking more about in this lecture as well. Um, so uh, once we have uh, an opinion about a person, how does this influence how we treat this person? And this is a topic that's also been studied over and over again in social psychology. Already in 1977 by a researcher called Snyder, he conducted also, uh, a, a, I think, a very nice experiment in which he matched female and male students. These uh, students were all real, uh, actual participants of uh, the experiment. They didn't know each other. They were also not allowed to see each other, but the researcher made pairs. Uh, they were matched ra randomly, and uh, the uh, task was really easy. The man was asked, or the male student was asked, to call a female student that he was matched with. Before they would have a conversation, the male would receive some basic information. For example, her name, maybe a little bit of background information. And he also saw a picture. And this was fake. So the male student saw a fake picture of 
a female student, either of a relatively attractive student or of a less attractive uh, student. And the pictures you see now on the screen are not of real participants. These are actually computer animated pictures, uh, not used by Snyder in 1977. I'm pretty sure that technology didn't exist by then. But these are, are, are pictures that are just, so not real, not actual persons, but used. Um, they use sort of uh, the, 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 the rules of attractiveness, basically, to, to make these uh, faces uh, either more or less attractive, while remaining certain other characteristic constant, like the hair and the t-shirt and the background, and the skin also, pretty much. Um, so, okay, there was this match, male called to female, and the only thing that differed was the picture that they saw beforehand. So by now, I think you can already predict a little bit what happened, right? You're now starting to become experts in social psychology, so you can probably guess that the conversations were different in the two groups. So the males that were under the impression that they were calling a, an attractive female versus the, the males that were under the impression that they were calling a less attractive females. Indeed, the, the conversations were different. So these conversations were videotaped, and later on, the conversations were rated by independent raters that didn't know anything about the study, and were only asked to either listen to the male or listen to the female and judge how friendly these conversations were and how friendly the male was to this female and vice versa. And what the researchers found was indeed a difference. So when a male was calling a, a female student and he thought she was attractive, and remember these pictures were fake, he was behaving in a more friendly way. And as a response, the female also responded friendly. So these conversations went very smoothly. There was laughter, there was fun interactions, it was just a nice little chat. While wow, there was a different situation when the male was calling a female student that he thought was less attractive. And even though these females had no idea that these males saw a fake picture, they responded. So if you get a phone call from a guy that's not really excited to talk to you and not very friendly, of course, you're also not going to be friendly in return. So again, this is an example of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Our expectation sets in motion our behavior. And also we know, and I uh, just want to repeat this, that there's something called belief perseverance. That's the tendency to stick with an initial judgment even in the face of new information. So even if these males would have been informed the pictures that you saw were completely fake, it's very hard to change your mind. So these ideas stick. Pictures you see beforehand, even if you retrospectively know these pictures are fake, steer your judgment. So here you already see the impact of attractiveness. And attractiveness is something that we have to talk about when it comes to impression formation and first impressions. Uh, and that is because beautiful people have a big advantage in the world of first impressions. This is referred to the, uh, in the overall umbrella term halo effect. A halo effect means that once we see a positive trait, a positive characteristic, we tend to believe uh, or expect there's, that there's going to be more positive things about this person. So if a person is attractive, we also mistakenly think that this person will probably also have other good character traits. Uh, so basically this is a stereotype about attractive people, sort of that what is beautiful is good stereotype. Uh, and we see this um, if we look at how beautiful people are treated in the world. Uh, if you happen to have a more attractive face, you have more success on dating applications, you have more dates, you have more pleasant uh, conversations generally, but also specifically when it comes to, uh, to mating and, and finding, finding a partner. Maybe not a big surprise there, but it is quite surprising that this effect of beauty actually goes much further than only the domain of, of forming uh, re relationships. We know that attractive politicians, for example, also get more votes than less attractive politicians, even when they sort of share uh, the same uh, agenda points and, and are basically comparable on many other domains, attractiveness matters a lot. We love voting for attractive politicians more so than less attractive politicians. Also, if you're on the job market, you have a much higher chance of both getting a job and also once you have a job, attractive uh, uh, candidates, job candidates, get paid more. So they get offered higher salary 
than less attractive candidates. Um, so this, this is actually quite a big difference, and I think this is something that we should also consider uh, when we look at fairness, and for example, there's now uh, luckily uh, a lot of focus also on distributions between males and females, and females get more chances on the job market uh, in some areas, for example, in science, which I think is, a, is, is great. But we should also be, be very um, uh, much aware of the fact that attractiveness matters as well, and that there's also discrimination based on attractiveness. Um, and also, even in, when it comes to, to criminal behavior, we know that attractive criminals are less likely to go to prison and also get lower fines. So across the board, attractiveness really sort of is a big benefit in life, which might also explain our huge focus, especially in the Western world, on beauty. But it's actually also something that is across the globe uh, that, that people are really um, on the lookout of, of uh, improving their, their appearance which makes sense. So it makes sense in the sense that you just have better chances in life if you happen to be attractive. Um, why is this? Um, well, there's actually two explanations. One evolutionary explanation. We know, for example, that newborn babies of just a couple of days old already have a preference for looking at beautiful faces compared to less attractive faces. So if you have a really small baby on your lap, and you happen to be very attractive, then this baby keeps on gazing into your eyes, more so than if you are less attractive. Um, so it's, in a way, it's sort of, um, we are born with this tendency to prefer beauty. Uh, why this is might have to do with, with evolution as well, that beauty is sort of a signal for, for reproduction value, maybe, or, or health. Uh, there's some, some debate on that. Um, but apart from being born with it, there's definitely also we are impacted and formed and shaped by uh, the way we are brought up. Uh, for example, look at the Disney princesses. Aren't they all just so, so pretty? Then look at the villains. Less attractive, right? So this is also good people, also in movies, starting with, with Disney movies, but this is also in Hollywood blockbusters. The good guys are typically very attractive. And the villains are less attractive, or they have some, something in their face, or, or um, uh, scars maybe, or they have just weird aspects, like a very, uh, they are uh, much, much uh, um, uh, less skinny, they, are, um, they have a big nose, you name it. So here you see examples of, of less attractive uh, villains. So this is also that, something that is sort of forced upon us, um, learned behavior uh, throughout our upbringing. Okay, so we talked about appearance, uh, but if you see a person or you look up information, like you could look up my LinkedIn profile, you see it over here, you see my appearance, you see what I look like, but you also come across much more information, for example, about my gender, my age, my ethnicity, my nationality, and each part of this information is steering your judgment, is helping you to form an impression of me. And I say helping you, but I should, you know, put that in quotation marks, because it can also really put you on the wrong foot and give you the wrong impression about who I am and what personality traits I have. Um, so we tend to judge personalities the moment we see a person. But we don't only judge personalities, we also judge emotions. So, um, and this is also part of, actually a big, big part of the evolution theory. Darwin already came up with that, that when it comes to emotions, people are key asper, experts in both encoding and decoding emotions. And that means that uh, with encoding, we mean displaying emotions. We know how to sort of display emotions, key emotions in the face. And we also know how to read emotions. And uh, here you see uh, the six basic emotions uh, that people can both encode and decode. And we tend to be very good at this. Um, so I hope you can all recognize them, uh, all the different emotions. Uh, you see anger, you see happiness, uh, sorry, happiness, surprise, disgust, sadness, um, and uh, what am I missing? Disgust, I said? Okay, so you see the six basic emotions, um, and uh, we can read them very well, uh, and we can also show them in the face. And this has a big evolutionary value, of course, because once we see that a person is, for example, scared, we know that there might be something dangerous in the surroundings, so we might also adapt our behavior. If a person is angry, we read that in the face, and we can use that, for example, to make sure we go out of the way of this person, to uh, make sure we don't get in a conflict situation. Um, 
all people can do this across cultures. We can read and recognize these emotions and show these emotions. But it's important to know that when it comes to emotion, there's also something called display rules, and that has to do with culture. So across the globe, even though we all are familiar with certain types of emotions, um, there is some differences between cultures in when it is appropriate to show certain emotions. For example, in Japan, uh, negative emotions tend to be covered up. It's sort of impolite to show negative emotions across the board. Um, well, for example, in the United States, sadness is pretty much inappropriate to show for males, but it is appropriate for females. So, you know, it's, it is complicated, and culture does play a very big role in uh, when, uh, when, when and how people show uh, emotions. So in this part of the lecture, we saw that even before we have a conversation, even before an interaction starts, just by seeing a person, we are already really informed uh, about what this person is like. We have judgment about personality and about emotion. So in a way, before anything is said at all, a lot actually already has been said. So in the final part of this lecture, we're going to see what happens when we indeed actually get to interact with the person.